Good morning. It's amazing to make a grand entrance and all of your papers fall all over the floor. I was really kneeling in prayer over there. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to worship. Wow. Welcome to worship. We serve an awesome God who moves in ways we don't often see. And yet is often calling us to a place of grace and peace that never leaves the human soul. Welcome to worship. Oh, come on, welcome to worship. We can't get excited about serving an amazing God. I'm Pastor Mike. If you're visiting with us for the first time, this is what we do sometimes. We are grateful. We celebrate. Uh, we pause for prayer. We really hold out all of our love for those we care about. So glad you're with us. I want to remind everyone to take a moment. If you'll sign the attendance pad, um, pass it along. Maybe there's a name or someone you'll get to know today that uh, will help you continue to extend that radical hospitality that is so much a part of our life together. Um, welcome those who are watching online. So glad you're with us. And it has been my prayer this week that the same spirit of grace and presence that is here I know is where you are at. I want to remind everybody, whether you're online or, or trying to find some ways to be generous in the week, we not only have regular bulletins and we have those welcome uh, little uh, card inserts in the card pockets and the pews, but you can always also give online as a way of uh, reminding yourself to be generous towards God through the week. We're so grateful for your support of the web ministry, and this morning we want to thank Meg and Cindy and, and Sue for their gift to the web ministry, honoring Jonesy's 93rd birthday coming up on April 1st, it's later this week, Debbie Bernard who gave a gift in honor of Nancy Nixdorf. Yeah. And uh, an anonymous gift in honor and memory of Cindy Donovan, who uh, passed away a little over a week ago. And uh, our hearts are, of course, with the family, with Tim. Uh, the flowers on the altar uh, come as a way of honoring and in memory of Cindy, uh, part of the, the sprays that, were, that adorned her service last week. And now they come to help us all give glory to God this morning. So glad you're with us. So I want to invite you, if you want to make a gift to the web ministry, there's a sign-up sheet right out there for you to, to indicate your presence. And, and I, you know, Easter is how far away? Three weeks. Three weeks, right? Have you been praying about someone to invite to Easter worship? Have you been thinking about a family member or a neighbor that you want to introduce them to the God of all creation, for whom even death is not a barrier to that grace and love? Begin praying about that, and, I, and I'll say a little bit more about our need for prayer in a little bit. So glad you're with us. So this morning, as we move into worship time, we're going to begin with a call to worship in just a minute. But here's what I want you to, to be thinking about. Are there things in your life, experiences you've had, things you've done, or things that have been done to you that make you feel like, I'm not valuable? I'm not worthwhile. Maybe it's a message you received when you were young and it still echoes in the back of your spirit. I'm not valuable. I'm not worthy. Later on in the message, we're going to hear about a woman who may have had those same thoughts, but something changed in her. Something changed in her when she met Jesus. And that's who I invite you to just open your heart to this morning as we come together to worship. Would you please stand and let us be joined in the call of the Lord. Do you want to come and do that? Great, thanks, man. <laughs> come, children of God, know that God has blessed you today. We are blessed by word and silence. By word and silence. Come, women and men, freed by a cross, following the Christ, who has not led you astray. We travel Jesus' path. We know glory and sacrifice. We find meaning, purpose, and life in following Jesus. Come, saints and sinners 
all, receive God's love and bounty. We offer our sacrifice of praise. We offer our very selves. Let us worship God. Good morning. Good morning. Be a sign of that amazing embrace of a forgiving and redeeming God. Let's greet one another say good morning and God bless you. privilege of mine for a, a, a young man who has been a part of this congregation way, way back. On Monday, uh, Bruce Felt celebrated his 92nd birthday. I hope when I'm 92, I can be as active as you are. But you know what? We should do this for everybody every week. But Bruce, can we sing happy birthday to you? We know it's a post sure birthday. Right, it's, it's all a cappella, so good luck. His name is Bruce. Speaking. What's that? It, it'll say be speaking. It'll say be speaking. Right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. things about Fulton that most folks have forgotten. And so if you ever get a chance to sit down with them and, and learn, it, it's just, it's inspiring. So happy birthday, my friend. Um, a bunch of prayers for us to hold in our hearts uh, today, this week. Mackenzie Dunbar has a planned appendectomy Wednesday in surgery, so we want to keep her in our prayers, please. Uh, Paulette Sampson's sister Janelle uh, has tested for counter for cancer. Her blood count is very low, which is not a good sign, so we need to keep Janelle in our prayers. I got a uh, message from uh, Lisa Williams. Her daughter Lena has really been dealing with some serious respiratory issues that have yet to be resolved. She may have to go for some hospital care overnight. So can we pray for Lena Williams? She's, uh, what, seven or eight, I believe? Eight years old. And so... We need to pray for her. Uh, the Guerrero family, did I get that correct? Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, Vince Guerrero died Thursday night. Vince Guerrero died Thursday night. long been members of this community. Thank you, Al. So we want to keep them. Uh, for Nicole, who's recovering from surgery uh, related to the Casa family, and Heather for biopsies. And, and I really want us to, uh, to be mindful. Uh, we all know change is coming. All kinds of changes in this congregation. Um, I, I, you know, I, my heart is really set towards towards really laying down every day prayer prayer for our congregation, prayer for our cabinet, uh, the district superintendents. Um, and and I'm of a mind, and I would like you to feedback with me on this. Uh, but maybe we really need to set aside this particular prayer time for people to gather together here. Maybe it's early on Sunday. Maybe it's one night a week. I think we really need, I really think that would be refreshing and a sign of God's continued grace for us if, if we all took 10 minutes every day. Um, someone suggested, what did they say when I heard, I was at a, a conference gathering of, uh, of uh, representatives of various districts. They, they talk about their district uh, prays every morning, all their district leadership at 6.07, and there's something significant about that. And I think it would really be something if we all took time every day to be intentional about this. You'll get an email on this and pray for our congregation as we move through change. 
pray for uh, the ministries of this church, pray for the cabinet, which is district superintendents and our bishop as they make uh, faithful decisions. Uh, pray for God's spirit, God's spirit to continue to do amazing things. So just three things. Can we all commit to pray 10 minutes a day, more if you got it, but specifically for the church? And if you have a field call to uh, take specific time on a, uh, on a morning, a Sunday morning before worship and want to meet with me to pray, uh, feedback with me on Facebook, email the church, you may have my personal email or just see me after worship. I, I really think we just need to bathe what God is doing in prayer. Will you join me in that, please? Will you join me in that? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So with that behind us, let us, uh, let us pray. <coughs> oh, how the scriptures say, O oh Lord, how the mountains tremble and fall into the sea. And man, we know what that's like. That is, that is life ever changing around us. The unexpected, the unplanned, the, the unanticipated. Mountains falling into the sea, the earth shakes and rumbles. Life changes all around us. We, we live in life. And, and we, we love homostasis. We love things to stay the same, but we even our spiritual lives to call us to something deeper and richer, some kind of change from the inside out that stills us in the middle of storms. And so to you we go this morning, O oh God of creation, for we are hungry. We are hungry for, for moral values. Moral values that influence our neighbors and our loved ones. We, we hear again of, of someone choosing the evil way of of violence and in, in, in England. And then we wake up this morning and hear of, of, of people dead and gunshots at a, at a club in Cincinnati. And, and we wonder, God, where is, where is people's moral values? And, and that's something that's caught more than taught, isn't it, God? So help us. Help us to live the kind of values that rub off on others because they see something different in us. So we're hungry, God, for our lives to make a difference. We're hungry. We're thirsty, oh God, for your spirit to, to, to feed our souls, to quench our thirst when we feel left out, when we feel marginalized, pushed away, when we feel like there's something that has happened to me or something I did that somehow would, would push us out of your love and grace. We're thirsty for you, Jesus, because we want our lives to be the same. We want our world to be like the kingdom of God. We're hungry for healing people we love and care about who grieve today. People we love and care about who, who need your spirit's comfort. Hungry and thirsty for people who are going through surgeries this week for an eight-year-old child who, who continues to battle a respiratory issue that, that has truly sidelined her from life. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we lift these names to you. Janelle and Mackenzie and Lena and Nicole and Heather. But I bet we arrive with the name of our own hearts and lift up to you now for your healing. For your healing. We pray for Meryl. We pray for the cabinet of the Upper New York Annual Conference in which we are a part of amazing things happen through the power of we when we unite our generosity, our service with those of other congregations, amazing things. We, we touch the world. But they need your wisdom and they need your guidance for, for they are called to make important decisions on our behalf, on behalf of so many congregations. Continue to breathe your Holy Spirit. 
pray for our congregation in the middle of change. The earth shakes, the mountains fall into the sea, and yet in the middle of all that, you say, be still. In the middle of all of that, Lord, you say, be still. How can we be still and know that you are God? So we are hungry for you. Thirsty. 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 We pray for your Holy Spirit's guidance among our children. Their names we lift to you in our hearts. Among our teenagers. In that weird time of life as they're moving from childhood to adult and experimenting with, with values and orientation. Lord, Lord, be upon them and guide them and, and give us as parents and, and mentors and and youth counselors and youth guys give us wisdom. And Lord, just clear our hearts of any judgment. That we may be Jesus. That we look on someone not by the color of their skin or, or not from the country of origin. We look on someone not because they live on one side of the tracks and we live on the other. Not because they come from East Syracuse or... Or someplace in a rural part of us. It doesn't matter where they come from. Lord, help us to see people and to declare the Christ in them by faith. But all of this and so much more we ask in the name of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Ethan. How are you? All right. So, I want to, we're going to, Chris, would you go to the Lord's Prayer, please? We've been talking about the Lord's Prayer, the thing we say every day. Maybe that's something you can say with your family right before bedtime. And, and today we're going to talk about give us this day our daily bread. And I want to start talking about that by asking this question. Do you have favorite toys? Do you have favorite toys? Your Skylanders? Do you have a lot of Skylanders or a little? You have a lot. Awesome. What's your favorite? Two Skylanders, too. How about y'all? Do you have favorite toys? No? Not really? How about clothes? Do you have favorite clothes? Yeah. Your what? Your, your mind crashers? Is that what you said? Oh, your mind crash shirts. Excellent. Well, here's a couple of my favorite toys. Frisbees. Now, this Frisbee actually has a little blinking light on it. I love to play... Frisbee, Frisbee Golf, Ultimate Frisbee. Golf is easier on my bones than Ultimate Frisbee, but I love, and I must have six of these kinds of Frisbees in my house. I even carry them with me in my car, because you never know when you can get a Frisbee golf game in. But you know, I was going through my closet the other day, as I was thinking about, give us this day on day of bed. What was Jesus talking about? Was he talking about bread, or was he talking about other things? He wasn't. I'll explain that. But here's, I want to show you. I went through my closet. I have a lot of shirts. I have too many shirts. I have way too many shirts. So the nice thing is that if you have too many clothes, we can give them to St. Paulie's. And that helps us reach the world with, for Jesus. But look, I got, I, this, this is just part of my pile of shirts I don't even wear anymore. But they're in my closet and they're taking out space to... Three, four, oh, there's a Ryan Fitzgerald Bills shirt, huh? That takes me back to the day, doesn't it? Remember those days, all you Bills fans? No. <laughs> all right. Yeah, right here. <laughs> crickets, crickets, another shirt, another shirt. I look at all these shirts, and this is not even the whole pile of shirts. Why do I have so many shirts? Because I buy too many. That is a perfect answer. And, you know... Jesus said, give us this day of daily bread. And you're right. Because back in Jesus' day, people needed bread. Because there are a lot of people that, that... How many times do you go home and open up your refrigerator when you're hungry? Or your pantry when you're hungry and there's food there, huh? I love that. But back in Jesus' day, they didn't have refrigerators. And some of them didn't even have enough to eat every day. But bread was really important. That's how they got a lot of nutrition. That's how they filled their bellies. That's how they made sandwiches. That's how they made sandwiches. Exactly right. So here's the thing. Jesus wants us to give us this day our daily bread because he, he wants to tell us something very important. When I buy so many shirts, it's very clear to me that I don't need more shirts. And sometimes we buy lots of toys, we buy lots of TVs, we buy lots of furniture, we buy lots of clothes. Like we feel like we're never going to have enough. We're never going to have enough toys. We're never going to have enough frisbee golf. We're never going to have enough clothes. Jesus is saying, why don't you trust me? Why don't you trust me? So when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, what we're really saying is, Jesus, help me to trust you for the things I need. Not all the clothes, but just enough clothes to get through today. Thank you, Jesus, for providing clothes to my mom and dad or my grandparents or, or even Santa. It could be Jesus, too. He wants us to remember to be thankful and to remember something very important that we often forget. God supplies our needs every day. And we sometimes forget that. When I open my refrigerator door and see all of the, the milk and the orange juice and the fruit and the food in there, you know what? 
I don't think about being thankful to God for that. I think about, gee, I hope I have enough. And yet there are boys and girls in this country, in Fulton, around the world, who don't have enough every day. So when Jesus says to us, give us this day or day, everybody remind us to be thankful for the gifts every day and to be generous with our bread or our food or our toys or our clothes so that God can help feed them too. Now you look like you have a burning comment, Ethan. What was it? You found that. Thank you for finding that. That's part of our Christmas tree, isn't it? Thank you so much for finding that. Give us this day our daily bread. It's a reminder to all of us, all of God's children, to say thank you, God, for shelter. Thank you, God, for love. Thank you, God, for food on my table. Thank you that you take care of me every day. Because sometimes I forget. And it's also a reminder to say, thank you, God, for giving me the ability to share with others so that they can have food and shelter too. Um, what is that helmet on that thing? What is that helmet on that thing? That's Larry. <laughs> That's Larry the, the soldier. That's from the story of Jesus. I can't. Well, because I might break them. I don't want to break them. Okay, so let's pray. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. And everybody, when we get to give us this day our daily bread, we're going to stop and everybody say, thank you, God, for today. All right? And then we'll keep praying. And so if you can read, great. If not, just follow along. And say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in sin. Give us this day our daily bread. Let's pause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, man, you see this. Do you want to just bring those up? <laughs> We're still working this out as we go along. So our passage this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. You can come stand next to me. That's fine. <laughs> Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. Hear this, hear this account of the touch and presence of Jesus on a woman's life. A Pharisee invited Jesus to have dinner with him, and Jesus went to his house and sat down to eat. In that town was a woman who, woman who lived a sinful life. She heard that Jesus was eating in the Pharisee's house, so so she brought an alabaster jar full of perfume and stood behind Jesus. By his feet, she was crying and wetting his feet with her tears. Then she dried his feet with the hair, kissed him, and poured the perfume on them. When the Pharisee saw this, he said to himself, If this woman, if this man, meaning Jesus, really were a prophet, he would know who this woman is who is touching him. He would know what kind of sinful life she lives. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Yes, teacher, he said, tell me. There were two men who owed money to a money lender, Jesus began. One owed him 500 silver coins, coins and the other owed him 50. Neither of them could pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Which one then will love him more? I suppose, answered Simon, that it would be the one who has forgiven, who was forgiven more. You are right, said Jesus. And then he turned to the woman. And he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your home and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You did not welcome me with a kiss, but she has not stopped kissing my feet since I came. You provided no olive oil for my head, but she has covered my feet with perfume. I tell you then, the great love she has shown proves that her many sins have been forgiven. But whoever has been given, forgiven little shows only a little love. 
Then Jesus said to the woman, Your sins are forgiven. And the others sitting at the table began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? But Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. May God add the riches of God's blessings on those who read and hear the word of God and all of God's children said. Amen. When Jesus had raised Lazarus from death and dazzled all Jerusalem and Judea with his deeds, when Pharisees and ordinary priests, even the chief priest, Capias, were plotted to snuff out his life and work. When the only thing those plotting leaders really needed was some good excuse to lock him up or run him out, to crucify him or stone him, then they thought back upon his ministry and tried to find his weaknesses. For one thing, Jesus and his followers had in many ways, and for a dozen reasons, broken all the laws of Sabbath rule. Jesus and his twelve disciples had, for instance, traveled, worked, prepared their food, healed on Saturdays, and in those days, and to those priests and leaders, that was a sin. But Jesus was also in trouble in some other ways. There had been many days where he spent time with sinners and even ate with them. A sinner, you understand, was a person who was quite openly and blatantly lived outside of and held in contempt the Jews' religious laws. Tax collectors were such sinners like Christ's disciple Matthew and Zacchaeus too. The other group was prostitutes, women who were agents of adultery and enemies of home and family and propriety. These were the outcasts of society. Outsiders, the writers of the normal and expected pass of proper folk. It was no joking matter of the Pharisees to see how these outsiders flocked to Jesus and his teachings. And how he dealt with them. He taught of love, of God's love, and our own. They had all grown up believing that the God of Abraham and Jacob was a God of hate, of justice, of eye for eye. The hope they soon learned from Jesus was forgiveness. And with authority. Almost as if he spoke for God, he offered that. That they hungered for, and that they heard. They came from miles around to hear his word, to feel the gentle touch upon their foreheads, and to know that they were free at last from guilt and stains and echoes of their past. There are some outcasts in every age and place who feel at last the weight of their accumulated sin. Then they try whatever remedies they can. When Jesus comes along with his authority, he offers them escape and forgiveness, peace and hope. They soon begin believing that their lives no longer have to focus on the thens of yesterday, but can have freedom even in the now. Those persons, if they once allowed themselves to follow and believe, are so relieved, are so unburdened, are overflowing so with gratitude and praise that they can scarcely say or show just how they feel. The woman who anointed Jesus to speak was such a one. She felt so deeply her forgiveness that she rather made a scene. Banquets were such public functions in those days that a stranger like this woman could quite easily have walked right in and acted out her gratefulness. The way of eating at banquets, then, would also lend itself to what she did. Jesus, like the other guests, would lie there on a bench, propped up on one elbow, facing in. His, his feet were in position then, outside the circle, to be anointed and washed and wiped. And that is what the woman did. She wept her penitent tears upon his feet and wiped them with her hair. To use her hair like that would be humiliating then as now. Hair used as a towel, tangled, 
hanging down, strung out, was one part of her sacrifice. Kneeling there beside his feet, having touched them with her tears and hair and hands, she felt somehow a part of Jesus. A partner in his love. And that was trouble. There was in those days double what there is today. Guilt by association. To hang around with sinners, to touch and to be touched by them, was not allowed. To be religious was to be, to remain aloof as proof of holiness. Anyone, wa anyone who wanted a religious reputation would steer just as clear of tax collectors, prostitutes, and sinners as they would of lepers. The Pharisee called Simon, the banquet's host, was thinking just exactly that of Jesus. If Jesus really were a prophet, Simon thought, he would surely realize his feet were being handled by a sinner, by a woman of the streets. Jesus read his mind. He saw in Simon's eyes his accusation. The situation called for one of Jesus' special stories. There was a certain creditor, he said, who had two debtors. One owed him fifty and the other one five hundred. He forgave them both. I wonder which of them would love him most. I guess the one he had forgiven most. His host replied, There beside the woman, Jesus then applied the truth his story taught. When I walked into your house, he said, You did not give me water for my feet. The woman wet his feet with tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no embrace when I first entered here. The woman kissed his feet unceasingly. The woman was prepared with ointment for his feet. You are quite right that she has sinned. Her sins are very many, but they are now forgiven. Her greater love has brought her great forgiveness. Jesus said, he then declared to her the shocking words. Your sins are now forgiven. They could not live with Jesus' words. His claim that he, like God, could wipe out sin, could make one whole again and clean. The Pharisee had seen the deep response forgiveness triggered in the lady of the streets. Imagine if he keeps on doing this, he thought. Imagine if people keep believing he has power over sin. That would be no more than just the beginning. They would soon be thinking that this Jesus, this preaching healer from the streets, they would soon begin to think of him as God. How strange they did not, more of them in those days, know that he is God. He was God then. He is God now. He is your God. And mine. His human and divine achievement, healing on the streets of cities and teaching on the shores of seas. And bleeding on the cross. Was to create forgiveness in a new and special way. No longer need we shed the blood of animals and birds to sprinkle on our altars. No longer we need burn their flesh nor burn the produce of our hands and lands to satisfy an angry God. No longer we need, like Pharisees of old, spend all our time defining sin, then trying in such superhuman ways to keep from sinning. The death of Jesus and his resurrection, they were a new beginning. We now can know our Lord and God's own Spirit can be with us every moment of every day we live. And by the shedding of Christ's blood, His death upon the cross, we can make forgiveness our companion always. What He does is free us from a constant threat of sin. The fear that we should just suddenly and with no warning die. That some obscure or shameful or persistent sin that we have not confessed, or some sin, then unrecognized and therefore unconfessable, would tear us at death's moment from our Lord and his reward. Because of Christ, we need not make a big production out of sin, nor work so hard to earn our way to God's love. The way has already been earned. 
The way has already been paid. The pavement to our God is laid by Christ Himself that we might walk to our forever unafraid. Soul, or faith is the sole requirement. And even faith is gift. No matter whether our rebellion or our rift in giant outward sin, like that forgiven woman at the banquet. Or giant, quiet, inward sin like hatred or jealousy or greed. The blood of Christ can answer every need. And heal our wounds. And make all well. And free us from the claws of sin and death, the jaws of hell, each day, each moment. As we go his way. And as we work and pray. And learn that all of us, like the most grateful woman, have been forgiven much. And can ourselves <coughs> be grateful. And can love. Thank mm-hmm. you.